Before we begin today's presentation, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to address with you all. Today's presentation includes a slide deck along with screen share. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon in the top right corner of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. To ensure an optimal viewing experience of the live demo, please ensure that you have checked system requirements along with bandwidth considerations. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help link located via the question mark widget at the bottom left of your screen where you will find details about system requirements and frequently asked questions. If you experience a blank screen during the demo, please try refreshing your browser as there may be a brief delay when the screen share starts. To ask questions at the end of today's presentation, please type your questions into the Q&A widget and hit submit. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. Also, notice the Learn More widget. Here, we've added a copy of today's slide presentation along with some additional content, including an overview of Topaz as well as a couple of additional Topaz demos. We also encourage you to fill out our survey before the end of today's presentation. And by submitting your response, you will automatically be entered to win a spectacular $50 American Express gift card. Once again, if you have any technical difficulties during today's presentation, please try refreshing your screen or click on the help link located via the question mark widget at the bottom of your screen where you will find details about system requirements and frequently asked questions. We are extremely pleased to have as our speakers today CompuWare product managers Jim Liebert and Mark Schettenhelm. With that, I'd now like to welcome and hand things over to Jim. Thanks, Janet, and welcome, everyone. And I just want to mention for the sake of the recording and people that will watch the replay in the future that this was recorded on October 29th, and that explains kind of the subtle Halloween theme that goes throughout the slides. What we'd like to start with is listing three worries that often keep programmers up at night. Where do you start when you don't know where to start? We've often heard how writers fear the blank page. Well, every programming task is a blank, starts out as a blank page as well. And it can actually be worse because in mainframe development, often development tasks are built upon existing code. So not only does a task begin as a blank page, but it also begins as a black box. And often you can hit a case where you get that paralysis by analysis where you're just not sure where to start and you don't have enough information to be confident where you start. And so you delay the start, which of course has repercussions um, when you finish. And what we're going to do in this presentation is show you how Topaz can help you eliminate this worry. How do you know what you don't know? OK, so now we're well underway on our programming tasks. And oftentimes, um, you know, we're moving smoothly, but there's always a nagging thought in the back of your head that you're forgetting something. And I equate this to that recurring nightmare people have in high school where they show up for a class and suddenly it's an exam that they haven't studied for. And this can have repercussions as well as you, things are going smoothly and you think you're ahead of schedule. And almost anyone that has had programming experience has experienced this when suddenly somebody mentions something and you realize you hadn't taken a huge factor into account and where you originally thought you were ahead of schedule, it turns out you're well behind schedule. Again, we're going to take a look at how Topaz can help give you the confidence that you're covering all the bases as you do your development. And finally, the third worry. How do you fix something without breaking something else? And again, the first worry was really the kind of how do we get started. The second one is while we're in progress, how can we be confident that we're covering all the facets? And now this third one often comes into play just as you move your changes into production. You're confident that your changes address your specific assignment, but the big X factor is does it introduce something else, the fear of unintended consequences. And really the worst case scenario is you fix your 
specific assignment, but you introduce a much worse problem. And again, what we're asking you is here is keep in mind these three worries as we go through Topaz for program analysis. And hopefully you'll see parts of the product, capabilities within the product that will allow you to cross these worries off your list. And to begin that process, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, and he's going to show us a live demo of the Runtime Visualizer. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to start off with something that, you know, Jim talked about all these fears. This might be the nightmare scenario where you're assigned to work on a program and you've never seen it before, and you know that it's very complex, and everybody's really afraid of it because it calls something else, which calls something else, and there's DB2 calls, and, and you, you really don't know where to start. You don't really know anything about it. What you need is some basic information as to how this thing is all put together and how it kind of flows. Um, so what I'm going to do is submit this job in using the Topaz for Program Analysis Runtime Visualizer. So it's just running the job um, without, I don't have to worry about having the source available. And as it runs, well, let me just show you. I just submit it, sit back, and it comes up here in Topaz, and I can actually watch it being built. So I can see the main program there clearly, and it's calling other programs, and as other programs are called, they are charted automatically. I can also see that it's calling DB2, so I know that's involved if it called IMS or there were files. I would also see those. And again, this is running it without having to have any source. Very easy setup. I just basically submit it for batch or I can go in and do online ones as well. And the information, not only do you have the chart, but below, I'm going to bring this up a little bit more, I can actually see every call being made. So I can see that one program calls another program. I have a timestamp for it, the type of call, the library that it is in, the language that it is, and also the offset within a program where it's called really helps me understand what's involved and also having the libraries so I know I've got the right versions, you know, especially if I'm setting up a test. Did I pull the test version or did I pull the production version? I'm going to stop this replay right now and show you how you can go in and bring these in because all these things can be saved. So like this picture up at the top, I can export it and I can make it into a JPEG or a PNG. I can put it off into Visio or I can make a PDF of it. So if you have it as a Visio, you can go in and combine and work with it and produce your own charts. Down below, I have all the individual events. That can be exported as a CSV file. So once it, I have that, I can put it into something like Excel and do my own analysis on it. Or what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to get out of here and bring it back in. I can replay it anytime I want. There it is. So I found where I saved that CSV. I bring it in, and this time I'm going to bring in the whole thing, the whole play. And this one had 50,000 different um, events, so 50,000 different calls. So it was quite a big, complex run, and I brought that all in. The advantage of that is that I can run this watch it, and if I find something that's interesting or, you know, I want to show it to someone else, I don't have to rerun the job. It's saved. And then the other thing that's very helpful is that I can go in and run it one way, because this is, again, runtime. It isn't a static analysis. It's dynamic. And I can have one set of inputs or data. And once I run it one way, I can say, okay, it calls all these if I'm adding an order, but if I alter an order or change an order, it's a different path. I can go and record those different paths, save those as different files, and bring those in. And that way, if someone's new to it, they don't have to run it again. You can just go and pull that one up and say, okay, this is how we process this one type. And once it's in, I can also step forward and 
run it through and run backwards and see how it goes through. Anytime I click on one of these, I can see information on it. So I can see the library, the language, um, that it's a program, the offset that it calls. Another interesting thing is the counts. And I found some interesting things in here. If you look down across the bottom, there's several of these that are calling it 500 times they're going after DB2, several different programs. So that leads me to believe that it's just suspicious. Are they all going after the same thing? Should those modules really be combined into one so that they're all doing the same thing? Or they really should be separate. Something I want to investigate. Uh, what I would probably do is next time I ran it, set a breakpoint for those in Expediter, or more likely bring it up in Topaz for program analysis so I can get a deep dive look at it. I also want to look for big counts. Like I have a lot of these are counts of three, it's calling one or two, and those might be just setting up things. But when I get something like this one that's 6,312 times that this program is C001P032, it shows, is calling DB2, that draws my attention. And if I look across here, I also see there's another one that does 7,000 calls. Those are really doing a lot of work in DB2. So I might wonder, well, are those just modules that just do DB2 calls? I just pass them something and they call? Or is there real processing there? So really what I'm using this for is to find the suspects. I might have 30, 40 programs here. I can't look at them all. I don't want to look at them all. But what I could now have done is narrowed it down to those two programs. I want to take a quick look at those through Topaz program analysis and see do they just do calls or are they processing there? If they just are doing calls, I'm going to go back up the chain in here and find the programs that call them. Um, and then I also want to separately look at those ones doing the same number of calls and see what's going on there. I've gained a lot of valuable information here. I've cut through these programs, so I now know the ones that I'm interested in. So again, it's runtime. It's a real run. Uh, easy setup, there's really nothing to it, and you don't need the source. I'm going to show you another thing here, and that's what we call differential analysis. When I was discussing this with a customer, they brought this up as how they would really use this. And I mentioned that I could record one run, and then I could record it maybe with different data, another run, and then I could go and look through it, and what they brought up was I could just compare the files. Topaz has built into it a file difference um, tool. So I brought in both versions of this CSV file where I ran it one way and I ran another way, and the differences pointed one area here where I'm calling a program uh, C001P027, but in this other version I'm calling a different program there a program P030. So it's a differential analysis. And I think where that would really be helpful is not only in trying to understand the differences between updating an order or deleting an order for those type of processes to really see what programs are involved in the differences, but also for production turnover time. It's another check to make sure that your changes did as expected. So you might put your changes in, you'd have one run, you know, before you would run one after and compare. A lot of times you don't want any difference in the calling. So you would just make sure that they were the same. Other times what you were doing would call new programs and do different processing. So you'd want to make sure that those were there and record what the differences were. And it could also help you debug something. So if something doesn't seem right, you know exactly what it is. And I know the offset within the program where it made that call, I can go right back in there. Again, it's providing focus. It's providing those suspects when you're trying to understand this scary, scary code in the beginning, give you that confidence, and it provides the focus so that you can really master this. So it really isn't that scary. So in this case, something that I've never seen before, I was really scared about it, I can run through and I'm already understanding things in just minutes. 
I can really start to understand how it is. And then I'm ready for the really the next step is the more of the deep dive. So for that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Mark. And I think you can see why we at Compure are so excited about Topaz for program analysis. Not only does it bring some powerful capabilities to the developer, but I think it also has kind of an undeniable cool factor to it as well. Now what I'd like to talk about is you take that information that you've accumulated from Runtime Visualizer, and now there's more parts of Topaz for program analysis that can assist you throughout the development uh, life cycle. And um, I'm going to be kind of jumping around the product, so I'm actually going to operate from the safety net of a PowerPoint slide. The first thing is uh, mainframe online projects. One of the objectives of Topaz is to make the programming experience of the COBOL programmer very similar to the ex programming experience of the Java programmer. It's built on Eclipse, which is the kind of the de facto IDE for Java development, and so we wanted to take all the good parts of the Java development process and introduce them for the COBOL development process. And really where things differ is just where that pencil meets the paper, where you actually go in to make code changes, and either you're coding in COBOL or you're coding in Java or you're coding in PL1. That's where the actual differences is and try to keep it as consistent as possible in all of the processes. And one thing we noticed with Java developers is they do all of their work out of projects. So they have a project and really their day-to-day -day workflow is just exists in that project. And we wanted to um, create that same scenario for the mainframe. However, there are idiosyncrasies between the two that uh, typically a Java project, that Java developer has that code existing in their workspace. So they have that code, it's very often local to their machine. Where mainframe developers really want their source to continue to live on the mainframe. That's where their SCM tool is, and that's where they do their check-ins and check-outs, and really they want that code to exist one place. And so we introduced the concept of mainframe online projects to bring the power of projects to the mainframe developer, but still have it fit into their preferred environment. And here I should mention if you're fighting the real estate of the webcast, it helps if you maximize your browser and then maximize this presentation. That, that makes the presentation as large as possible. And here if you kind of look behind that call out, you can see that we've selected a bunch of files, um, some of them out of the data set PDA prod COBOL.source, and then one out of a different data set. We did a right click and we add those files to the project. And at that point, we have the ability to tell the, you, tell the product that we want to create a mainframe online project. So what is an online project? It's a logical collection of source that means something to you as a specific programmer, right? The most obvious use case might be if you take Mark's runtime visualizer example, you might grab all of those programs that were called in that execution and create that as your online project. Or you might take a subset of those programs if you're only interested in a subset of that application. Or you might actually take all of the programs from an entire application. It's really what makes sense to you as the programmer. The second thing is, you, and you can notice this if you look closely at the, what's happening behind the screen here, um, you can actually add um, multiple versions of a program. So here, in this case, you might add the production version of the program to your project and then also a version that you're going to change. And then moving forward, as you use the analysis feature of online projects, now you can see if your changed version is showing up on lists that the production version isn't, and that gives you an indicator of your changes you made. And here we're going to talk about one thing you can do with online projects, and this is often referred to as impact analysis. And this is very analogous to what you can do with Java. So with Java, you know, you have a project full of 
methods and classes, and you can right-click to bring up the hierarchy view to give you information on them. And now you can do the same thing with the mainframe online projects. You can right-click on a program, you can right-click on a copybook, and ask for the hierarchy view to give you information. And really this hones in on four specific capabilities. One is for a given program, what programs call it? And then conversely for that same program, what programs does it call? So again, if you look behind the callouts, you can see we're looking at program PDA-10 and we're currently showing the programs that it calls. And if you highlight one of those programs, it'll actually show you the line of code where it does the call. And if you double click on the program, it'll just bring it up in the editor. If you double click on the line, it'll bring it up in the editor at that line of code. Another thing you can do is for a given program, what copy books does it include? And then finally, for a given copy book, what programs include it? And again, what we're trying to do is kind of fill in those unknowns so as you begin to make changes, you can understand the impact your specific change, maybe on a specific program or a specific copy book, might impact the rest of the application. And of course, a really straightforward use case here is you've been charged with the task of enlarging one field in a copy book. And now what you can do is just get a list of the programs that include that copy book, and then that list kind of turns into your to-do list. And you can just march down those programs and evaluate whether your change is going to have an impact on those programs. <clears throat> the next thing you can do is now, so now we understand kind of a larger view of your change. Now let's actually focus in on when you're actually editing a specific program to make your specific changes to that program. And again, here Topaz for Program Analysis allows you to do another tier of visualization similar to the runtime visualizer to provide some information. Now this is static where the runtime visualizer is dynamic. It's actually using runtime information. This is static analysis of your existing code. And here I have uh, program PDA014 open in the editor. We did a right click and we selected perform program analysis. And this opens up several more views that provide information. And what I'm just going to do is kind of go around the perspective and talk a little bit about the new views. The first one is what's known as the program summary. And here let's expand it so you can read it a little bit. And this gives you a nice summary of the kind of the personality of this program. And remember, in many cases, this might be a programmer coming in absolutely cold to this program. This might be their very first exposure to this program. So kind of at a glance, we can tell them how large it is. Um, we give them metrics that show how complicated it is. We show them things like this program uses one file, and it looks like it uses two DB2 tables. So this is kind of a handshake introduction into this program. If we continue kind of going around the perspective and looking at other views, the other thing we'll do is Topaz for Program Analysis will run through the program and build a program structure chart. So this is the flow chart of the program. So you can see, in this case, it's COBOL. So you can see um, which paragraphs call which paragraphs. Uh, if it was PL1, we could show you which procs call which procs. Um, you'll notice that there's some paragraphs kind of unattached, floating over on the left and the right. That's dead code in this program. That's paragraphs that are never executed in this program. If you follow the flow down, it will lead to if programs call or if paragraphs call subroutines, or if they do I.O., you'll see that in this flow chart. Um, you'll notice the colorization. This is currently colorized by uh, the, what's known as the McCabe complexity metrics. And so the ones that are slightly darker green are more complex. You can control that colorization to isolate paragraphs that do I.O. or paragraphs that call other programs, whatever makes sense to you. The other thing is you can now use this structure chart to navigate to the editor. So if you double click on one of these paragraph 
icons, it'll take you to that paragraph in the editor. So you can use the visualization to drive the editing. The second tier of, of this static visualization is, is what we call logic flow. So once you're in a paragraph, and let's expand this one too, we'll actually show you the logic of that paragraph or proc if it's PL1 visually. So here you can see that this starts with an if, and then if the if is either true or false, of course, and if it's true, it goes to that line 607, and if it's false, it goes to line 614, and then it leads back to a perform. So you can follow the code visually if you so desire. And again, clicking on one of these boxes will take you to that line of code in the editor. And really, to stress what we're trying to do here is we're trying to give you a visual understanding of the program. So really, you only have to go into the program when you specifically want to make changes. A lot of the understanding is abstracted from the logic, from the language the program was coded in. Now, where the logic flow helps you understand the flow of code in the program, we also provide a third tier of visualization called the data flow. And what this allows you to do is understand how data flows throughout variables in your program. And here we're looking at the kind of the variable of interest is this PDAS01-CO-year, and you can see that it's highlighted with a red border. And here you can turn on different um, levels of analysis. And actually, for the sake of this demo, we've turned on all of the levels of analysis. So here we're showing fields that affect this field. So for instance, WMF date-YY affects field CO-year. And if you click on that connector, it'll take you to the line of code where it does, where it moves data from that field to this field. Um, we also have the uh, level of detail that shows comparison. So you see the green dash line to 50. So at some point, this field is being compared to 50. The third thing we're showing you is fields that occupy the same place in storage. So for instance, uh, redefines in COBOL or a 05 field underneath an 01 field. Because remember, if you change that 05 field, you're also changing that, the value of the 01 field. So here we're, and that's what the dashed lines indicate. And then finally, we've turned on multiple depths. So not only are we showing you the fields that affect this field, we're showing you the fields that affect this field that affect this field. <laughs> so we're showing it to you at multiple depths. And really, if you follow the breadcrumbs here, you can see that our field, like let's say we were tasked with making a change to this ODY, ODYR field. Well, it, it also would affect a different field that would, if you look over to the left, actually get passed as a parameter to a program, PDAS01. And actually, that actually happens to be, in this case, a stored procedure. And this is what we mean about um, resolving that issue about unintended consequences, where, you know, a changing this field, and when you look at this program, you think, okay, I have all my bases covered. But then when you take this broader look, you look, oh, wait, I have to take this stored procedure into account here. And if you think back, as programs go into production, if they don't, if it doesn't fly, often the bug is very far removed from your specific change. So sometimes it's even hard to correlate your change to the bug. And here we're hoping to eliminate that pain whatsoever. Now some of these um, charts can get pretty complex as you might expect. So we also provide the same information in a table. And again, you know, I, I like to think of this as almost like a to-do list, is you could, if you're really worried about this field, you could just march down each of those occurrences in the table. Um, and again, double-clicking on it will take you to the reference in the code, and you can satisfy in your mind that you've addressed that change. So Mark walked you through the um, dynamic capabilities of Runtime Visualizer, and I've mar marked you marched you through the static capabilities of Topaz for Program Analysis. And so hopefully if you're thinking back on those three worries that we started with, um, suddenly they don't seem that big. 
Another way to look at this information is kind of as a funnel of detail, where Mark was looking at an actual execution and seeing everything that was involved in the execution and the order that it was involved during that execution. And like Mark mentioned in the presentation, that allows you to identify suspects. Like if the behavior isn't exactly as you expected or if you're making a change to a specific program, now you can see where it exists in the execution. And at a higher level, you can get a feel of the personality of your application. And then I suggested creating an online project, which now we're beginning to close in on the details of our changes. And again, the online project might be all of the programs involved in the visualizer. It might be all of the programs exposed by the visualizer and even more programs, or it might be a subset. It's totally up to you. But given that list of programs, it allows you to identify dependencies across those programs. So you can begin to understand, as you make your change, what impact it will have on the larger picture. And then finally, we're honing down to the utmost level of detail where you're specifically making changes to a specific program. And here we'll kind of maximize the information at your disposal just by opening the program up in the editor and performing program analysis. And we'll give you visual clues, and you can use the visual capabilities to actually edit the program. And that is really Topaz for program analysis as it exists today. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Mark, and let's see if there's any questions. All right, thanks, Jim. Yeah, what I'm, we've got several questions here, and I'm going to try to kind of group them as much as I can in the order in which things were presented. So we had a couple come in about the runtime visualizer, um, so I'm going to handle those right now. We had one, how do we configure this tool? Um, what, and I, I didn't show that, but it is in Topaz. You would go in through Expediter Eclipse in there. Um, so you do have, and that was another question we had here, is what products are required. Um, you have to have Topaz for program analysis, and you have to have Expediter for that environment, so TSO for batch, CICS for CSCS Online, or IMS for IMS Online. Um, and you have to have the current 9.4 release with the October maintenance, because that's when it came out. So you would go into Expediter Eclipse, set up your test as normally. Again, you don't have to have source for those programs. We'll get them anyway. And there's just one tab in there for Runtime Visualizer, and you check that tab that you want that on. So you'll go in there, set up a profile, just click Runtime Visualizer, submit it, and then you'll come to that perspective and you'll see it start to build the chart. So we got that. Um, okay. We have another question. Is this tracing an application, is it sampling an application more like strobe? Interesting question. You're <laughs> interested in how this thing really works? Um, and I kind of got to it there is we're using expert technology, uh, so we're not really sampling like strobe. We're not going out there because if we did sampling, we would miss things. So if you popped in every once in a while and tried to get something, you would miss a call. Uh, we looked at that. So we're, we're actually more involved with it with expert, but really minimal overhead. I mean, obviously, you're going to have some, but we're not in there examining every instruction. We're not duplicating the work, um, very low overhead. We're sort of waiting for events to happen, like a call, and then we're invoked. Um, so we're, we're involved in that way. We're not doing sampling. Um, we also have a question here. Is Topaz running on a, the mainframe or distributed platform? Kind of both. Um, the, Topaz is built on Eclipse, so it's distributed there, but as you can see, it's interacting with a lot of things on the mainframe. So it interacts with FileAid, with Expediter, so other products. Um, let's see, I want to do a couple on the online projects. Jim, I don't know if you see those. There's uh, one, is this only for online projects, and a question about projects in Endeavor. Okay, yeah, that, um 
is this only for online projects? That's a good question because I kind of skipped over that fact. Um, as I segued between online projects and uh, program analysis, the part that shows you the structure chart and the uh, data flow and logic flow, um, those two are actually independent of each other. So if you open up a program via online projects, you have access to program analysis. But if you just open up a program outside of online projects, you can still do program analysis. So for those of you that are familiar with Topaz, for instance, if you go into Host Explorer, and navigate to a data set, and then let's say it's a PDS, and you navigate to a member in that PDS, and you double click it to edit it, you can still do um, program analysis with that program. It doesn't have to exist in the project. The capability that the project gives you is those hierarchy views that show you the dependencies across programs. The second one is about an endeavor integration. And again, to answer this at the high level, um, Topaz provides a, a degree of Endeavor integration. And because it's built also, in addition, because it's built on the Eclipse framework, um, it's extensible, and you could actually plug in the CA Endeavor integration as well. And the kind of the specific question was, do products have Endeavor integration? And the answer is yes. You can include programs out of Endeavor into a project. Okay, um, there's a couple coming in here, again, trying to group them. Um, does Topaz interact with Dev Enterprise, Metadata Analyzer, Program Analyzer, Code Coverage? And then another one someone uh, uses, um, and that's Chuck. Hi, Chuck. Uh, program Analyzer, Metadata Analyzer for Impact Analysis, except by an administrator, do you need one? Um, they're, they're, they are separate, so what we showed you with the Topaz for Program Analysis is a separate tool. What's different is that it's actually with source that you could edit that you've brought in there and you saw that you're working through an edit session so, it's, so you can make a change, save it, and reanalyze it. So it's a different thing. Um, and no, you don't need an administrator where the metadata analyzer analyzes thousands, tens of thousands of programs and you need an administrator to set that up. With this, we designed it more for the individual developer, uh, so there is no administrator. They can work on their programs themselves, um, so there isn't that administrator needed, a lot simpler to work with. Um, we do have some questions on code coverage. Um, there is an Expedair code coverage product, and in the Topaz workbench, there is a part for code coverage, so you can see the code coverage display in there. Um, all right, uh, we've got a question here. Um, do we identify potential looping scenarios? Um, in the Topaz for program analysis, we go through and do a lot of uh, identification of code flaws, and we can, call, we can find recursive calls in there. We have a specific diagnostic for that, so a, a paragraph is calling itself. And so we can find those. And it's interesting in looking at customer portfolios. Every once in a while I do find one. It's a latent loop that obviously you haven't hit, but we do try to look for looping scenarios. Um, does this, will this product analyze both batch and CICS programs? Across the board, everything we talked about today works for batch, CICS, and online. Um, question on uh, languages. Um, the runtime visualizer will do uh, COBOL, PL1, assembler, and some C. But if um, the program analysis is going to be just COBOL and PL1. And it looks like I have time for one more question. Uh, does it Okay, okay, how, uh, we have a question on how to get Topaz and relates with existing mainframe programs. So uh, if you're interested in this, um, you know, contact CompuWare. It, it is a, something that uh, the Topaz for program analysis is built on top of our workbench technology and you would need a trial license to try that out. 
so that's a separate license thing. Um, a lot of the base components are something you get when you own the, the product itself. This is an additional thing, so contact us and we can give you probably a more in-depth demonstration and then you can try it on your own programs. So I'm sorry, I think that's it for time. Th thanks, Jim and Mark. Um, those questions that we were unable to answer, we will definitely get back with you directly after the webcast. And in the meantime, as we previously men mentioned, we encourage you to fill out the short survey so you can be entered into our spectacular $50 American Express uh, gift card drawing. And with that, thanks for attending today's webcast. And this concludes the presentation. Have a spectacular day.